Hello, I'm Dr. Louise Newson. I'm a GP and menopause specialist, and I'm also the founder of the Newson Health Menopause and Wellbeing Centre here in Stratford upon Avon. I'm also the founder of the Free Balance app. Each week on my podcast, join me and my special guests where we discuss all things perimenopause and menopause. We talk about the latest research, bust myths on menopause symptoms and treatments, and often share moving and always inspirational personal stories. This podcast is brought to you by the Newson Health Group, which has clinics across the UK dedicated to providing individualised perimenopause and menopause care for all women. So today on the podcast, I've got with me somebody who has been on the podcast before and hopefully a name that you'll all know, uh, Kate Muir, who is the most amazing um, now producer, didn't used to be, um, and she has produced the two Davina documentaries about HRT and the menopause. And now she's working on a contraceptive pill one, which I'm going to get her to come back, actually, and talk about once it's out later this year. But Kate and I met, some of you might realise, a little while ago, and she actually became a patient. And I'm not breaking confidentiality because (laughs) she's shared the story before. And actually, she's a very straightforward patient. Um, It wasn't straightforward, her story, but I knew that she needed the right dose and type of hormones. So once I did her consultation, we started talking about the um, injustice to women and the sheer horror of what's happened over the last 20 years or so with um, women not being allowed to have the right information to make the right decision. And she is now become a very vehement campaigner for uh, the right education, the right treatment for women, and has written an incredible book, as well as read probably nearly as many references and articles and papers and scientific journals that I have, which is no mean feat. Um, So Kate, um, I asked to do the podcast today and she decided to spin it on its head a bit so she can explain more what we're going to do over the next um, half an hour or so. So go for it, Kate. Well, I decided, Louise, that you've done over 200 podcasts and you're always asking the questions. And I actually have a lot of questions to ask you. And often you're sitting there agreeing with some expert, and I know you often know more than they do about some things. Um, And I just wanted to get a feel for the really big picture in menopause, because we're always looking at the kind of little niggles and the problems Mm. and the debates. Mm. And I want you to come with me tonight, today, and imagine the future. Um, And almost the first thing I want to ask you is, how do you imagine menopause will be in the UK in 10 years' time? What do you think will have changed? Well, do you know what? I have so many mind games and I think a lot about what the future could look like and what the future would look like and how much is reality and how much is in my dreams. And there's two things, as you know, are very different when you're talking about helping women because there's so much that's stopping and there's so much potential, but it's how we unlock it. Because I think once it's unlocked, it could go very quickly. And I feel it's that whole, we take two steps forward and one back. And I think actually when it's about women, it's probably one and a half back. And what is moving this whole conversation forward is women, actually, more than healthcare professionals, more than thought leaders, more than politicians. It's actually the grassroots of women and they're the ones that are affected. So I I really think a lot about how the world and the UK, obviously, would look like if all women who wanted hormones were able to get them. And not only get them, but get them in the right dose and type. Because as you know, about a third of women who come to my clinic are already on HRT. So Mm -hmm. 20 years ago as a GP, I'd give someone awful, you know, horses urine HRT, because that's all I had available. And they'd come back with some symptoms. And I would say, well, it can't be your menopause because you're on HRT. Because I didn't know anything else. I didn't know I could change the dose. I didn't know about testosterone. 
but now I do. And so if women have the right dose of estrogen, the right type of progesterone, if they need progesterone, and they were offered testosterone to the majority of women, not the minority of women, then how would it look? And I really dream that it would it could happen. And I think with more patient choice, with more availability of HRT, with more of access to the right information and knowledge, backed by science, of course, then 10 years actually is quite a long time. And I, I, I think that's quite ambitious, but actually I know what I've achieved over the last seven years with very little money, with very little resources. I've never had external funding, even for the app. So I feel that this momentum, if it carries on, we, we could achieve so much more where women are not not fobbed off women are able to have what they want and then you know the 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 bigger picture of women's health being better women being able to stay working women be able to be promoted at work women be able to lead households in ways that they'd not be able to women who can lead communities as well and having the conversation not just for British women but for women in all cultures as well um, it, the world would be so different and the UK would be so different I see all these nursing homes and residential homes being knocked up all the time they're full of menopausal women like, we wouldn't have all those we could have you know different different things you know the whole the whole generation below could be completely different and I would be so proud if it could happen because I think you, me, others have really played a big role in, in history making actually. Yeah and I think understanding you know about longevity and one of the things you mentioned to me the other day which was inflammaging and of course we love yes. aging and we love being wise but we do not want creaky joints and we do not want our bones turning to crunchy bars and we do not want to be the one in two women who get osteoporosis um and i just wanted you to tell me a little bit about what the better kind of hormones the transdermal uh, estrogen and the mm. body identical hormones are going to do to me like think of me i i'm about i'm i'm 59 this weekend actually um I, but you know normally between 60 and 70 that's when things get creaky in a woman and i want to tell you to tell me what's not going to happen to me how how is taking testosterone and estrogen and progesterone going to protect me for what is about to land yeah and this is really interesting because when you think about aging if we start with this first this i read a really great paper recently written um, in an ethical standpoint about is aging a disease or not and for years we've been told you can't have a disease if it affects the majority of a population because it that it's thought of as being normal but how do you define aging is it a number sadly you're going to be older at the weekend than yeah. you are now <laughs> we're aging all the time aren't we but when aging is associated with disease this is when it's a problem and as you say this whole inflammation this low-grade inflammation that occurs if our immune systems aren't primed and really healthy of course we can get infections but also we can get other diseases, these inflammatory diseases that occur are actually the diseases that are very common. So cardiovascular disease, diabetes, dementia, osteoporosis is even an inflammatory disease. We know a lot of mental health conditions, so uh, uh, clinical depression, schizophrenia, even Parkinson's disease are inflammatory diseases, obviously inflammatory bowel diseases and autoimmune diseases can be as well. And we know they're more common as people age, but we also know from some very interesting studies that if once women are menopausal, they have this accelerated aging and this accelerated risk of these inflammatory conditions. So none of us really want to age, but we are. That's fine. We can't stop that. I'm not bothered about a few wrinkles, but what I am bothered about is accelerated aging, this inflammation that can occur. And we know that there's all sorts of reasons why we get inflammation. One of the reasons is eating a rubbish diet. So if I fill my body with ultra processed foods, then I'm going to have more inflammatory um inflammation yeah in that's body. really interesting if I smoke. because I, if you look at those brain scans of people on your worst western diet yes. basically the brain scan on mcdonald's and the brain scan on vegetables and fish you actually see there are these huge holes in the brains of people 
who yeah. are living on a so rubbish diet and it's really frightening yeah it's very scary so so we know diet has a massive role to play we know that obviously smoking alcohol of course has a role to play not doing exercise has a role to play as well so all these things are choices of course we can all decide if we want to eat processed foods and t and takeaways every day or we could you know cook from scratch or or whatever that that's our choice the problem is, is with women we don't have a choice as to when we don't have hormones in our body for a lot of women it's just part of aging that our ovaries stop working as you know for some women that choice actually is a bit different because they have their ovaries removed and we know from walter rocker's work for the mayo clinic that women who are under the age of 40 who have their ovaries removed i.e become menopausal overnight have this accelerated aging mm -hmm. they have a lot of methylation of their receptors they have a lot more um aging and we it, all these diseases i've mentioned and more including kidney disease lung disease um even psychosis and drug addiction can increase because of having this early menopause so with aging we all want to be healthy it's about how we live it's it's living healthily for longer so it's not the number that we die or the age that we are, it's that journey and it's about preventing disease and keeping as healthy as possible. So this is where hormones do have a role, like all these other lifestyle interventions, but we know that there are receptors on our cells of inflammation in every single cell for estrogen and testosterone actually. And we know from well-established studies that if our immune system isn't primed properly, it, it doesn't work as well. If we have low estrogen levels, it doesn't work as well. So it, once we have estrogen, we know that we can change the way the immune cells work. We can increase the number. If we've got more of a good thing, obviously that's going to be good for our bodies. It can genetically reprogram these cells. So actually our immune cells can be more efficient. They can produce more cy cytokines that are chemicals that kill things in the body um, and they can just work in a lot better way and so if you've got your hormones which you have you're quite open that you take <laughs> hrt unless you change your mind over the last few days since i last saw you but so taking adequate estrogen will help reduce that inflammation testosterone hasn't been researched in the same way on our immune cells but we do know it's anti-inflammatory and anybody that's had muscle and joint pains that have improved on testosterone will tell you how you know inflammation improves we know that men are a lot less likely to have autoimmune diseases and at lot less likely to have diseases such as multiple sclerosis we know that testosterone can build the myelin sheath it can help um, the way that our nerve system works and so it is very likely that testosterone has a role in, in protecting from diseases such as MS and some of the other autoimmune diseases and I think probably has a really important role in protecting from dementia as well mm. So the body identical hormones that you're having, so the estrogen through the skin, is just the same hormone as what you were producing 20 or so years ago. It's just the natural estrogen, the progesterone is a natural progesterone, and the testosterone is natural testosterone. Testosterone is the most annoying name I think you could ever think about because it's not derived from the testes. We don't have testes. No. So testosterone... <laughs> is always thought of as a male hormone because it's produced from the testes, <laughs> testosterone. We sometimes refer to them as andro androgens, but that, again, is a male connotation. But it's from our ovaries, isn't it? It's coming from our ovaries. Yeah, absolutely. And our so it's coming from our ovaries and our adrenal glands and probably elsewhere, but actually it's just another biologically active hormone, but it's the most biologically active hormone that we have in our bodies, testosterone. And um, we produce a lot more testosterone than we do estrogen. And actually we produce more progesterone than estrogen when we're younger as well. So estrogen is probably the least significant hormone. So, you know, you having all these hormones, hopefully is going to help improve your longevity 
and the, the, the whole journey to older age is going to be a lot better for you. You know symptomatically you're so much better. When I first met you, you were, oh, you still do describe how awful it was that you couldn't remember words and your temper was quite vile at times and you didn't have the energy that you had. And, you know, I was looking at somebody today, I, I, I won't tell you her name, but she was um, she's quite well known, but she's one of my patients and visually she's changed so much over the last six months. Mm -hmm. And I know it's because she's got hormones on board. And yes, that's great. Her skin looks different. She looks younger. She looks more vibrant. She looks happier, but her skin has this glow. But actually, that's me thinking, well, what what's happening to her heart? What's happening to her lungs? Yeah. What's happening internally to her liver everything else i know she looks like she's lost a lot of weight as well and that's great i know she's been exercising and eating better but actually we know that the visceral fat the fat around our internal organs reduces with with hormones so it, this this skin appearance is just a window to all our other organs and that's what's happening obviously to you mm. to me to people that take hrt and and that's really really important when we think about disease prevention now we also know that none of the uh, societies the menopause society's guidance recommend hrt for disease prevention why and is in the that UK. why really? yeah well, uh, we are well, looking it, into the future and they're looking into the past what's happening yeah so i think there's a few things so when i go to quite high level meetings there's always this talk there isn't enough evidence and that's and you well, do can I action, say I've read say. so many papers and they may not be fast randomized controlled trials, but there are tons and tons of trials, say, talking about cardiovascular disease and the effect of having your estrogen back or keeping your estrogen. There Absolutely. is massive and, evidence. And, and it, again, I was talking the other night about what would a 12 year old think if you presented them with the evidence and a 12 year old would think, it looks to me like estrogen's really helping with stopping people having heart attacks. And why, yeah. why is there this incredible negativity to hormones? And well, I, I've sort of been thinking about this a lot, actually, because, as you know, I've got a pathology degree and I do enjoy science and basic science as well. Because in medicine, if you don't understand something, one of the things I do and I'm, a lot of other clinicians do is go back to basics. Just have a look at the basics. So if you knew nothing about HRT, you look at the diseases associated with no hormones. And we've talked about that at length before. So it does make sense, common sense, that actually if you've got an increased risk of dementia the longer you are without hormones then isn't the most obvious thing to put the hormones back to reduce your risk of dementia the same with cardiovascular disease osteoporosis everything else as well but if you look in in the usa they've grouped lots of societies together and they've all stated there isn't enough evidence and this was in jama recently that they actually did this big paper why there wasn't enough evidence for hrt to be dis as a disease preventative agent and a group of us actually wrote a letter to say there is enough uh, research actually to support this and we weren't the only group that wrote a letter so there are other people who are more learned academics than me who agree with this. So when I look about why is this happening, I can tell you, I think, this is me being a bit cynical, but I'm sure you'd agree, Kate. One of the reasons is that HRT is really cheap. So pharma are not interested in it. So, but also there's a lot of us, there's 1.2 billion menopausal women, 14 million in the UK. It's dirt cheap, but something dirt cheap times by 14 million is still quite a lot of money that they've got to shell out to us. So there's this, mm, don't really want to do that because it's short term pain for a longer term gain. Mm -hmm. But then also, if you think about America, who are dictating a lot more that we shouldn't be using HRT for disease prevention. Pharma is massive in America, yeah. a lot bigger than in the UK. So if women take HRT, we already know, we know it from our patients, we've got thousands of them, that women on HRT are less likely to take statins, they're less likely to take blood pressure lowering medication, they're less likely to take antidepressants, they're less likely to take painkillers, they're less likely to take sleeping tablets, and oh my goodness, they're less likely to take some of these expensive um, 
osteoporosis medication and dementia medication because they won't get these diseases. So what will happen with pharma if every woman who needed her hormones had them back? And actually, if we let's think about men, if every man had testosterone replacement when they needed it, about a third of men at least, we wouldn't need all these other medications. So pharma will be a lot reduced. And I can't think of any other explanation because the science is there to support it. We've got more evidence that HRT is beneficial at reducing cardiovascular disease and statins. Mm. Yet as GPs, when I was working as a GP, I was encouraged to prescribe statins yeah. because it helps with a quaff, it helps with a quality. Oh, formula, shall we talk about the quaffs? Way GPs should be because people don't know what quaffs are, but when you tell them, they're really shocked. So the the, the quality outcomes outcome framework. framework that's right so basically yeah. and you can explain it in more detail but the, basically your gp get, your gp surgery gets paid an extra 50 or 80 quid if they diagnose someone with depression if they diagnose someone with diabetes if they diagnose someone with using tobacco um and they get all this extra money for ticking these boxes and for a while they got money for just mentioning the, the coil at one point mentioning larks and just mentioning it at all they were giving an extra and then lots and lots more people took up the coil because the doctor had mentioned it now if we had a quaff which really wouldn't cost very much or we could swap one of the other quaffs over um that was just saying please mention menopause and hormone replacement therapy and what the possibilities are to the appropriate women uh, that would make this extraordinary change in the costs of the NHS. Um, but why aren't we going to do that? Yeah. Well, I mean, I um, was always a GP. Um, I was a salaried GP. So my salary was the same whether I saw one patient or 100 patients a day or whether I um, contributed to Quaff or not. My salary was the same. But you're absolutely right. For GP partners, for practices, they have this way of being paid. And the Quaffs do change quite a lot. Um, but there are certain targets. So if I saw you, for example, you were my patient in general practice and you had a range cholesterol if I gave you a statin and reduced your cholesterol then the practice would get paid if there were a percentage of people and I, I can't remember the percentages and they change all the time but it doesn't really matter you get paid more for a higher percentage of people whose cholesterol had reduced now you as a very educated woman would probably say to me Louise I'm not diabetic I haven't had a heart attack I'm really fit and well I exercise regularly I'm not overweight I don't smoke um, and I don't drink so actually my cholesterol isn't going to be the thing that's going to cause my heart disease and I don't want to take a statin because there are risks and actually when I've read the evidence there isn't good evidence that statins for primary prevention of heart disease in women is really that good so I'm going to refuse so I could then mark you as an exemption so you wouldn't be in part of these figures and I um, and, and that's that's absolutely fine but if you came to me and said I don't want to statin for all these reasons, but actually I would like to take HRT because I know it reduces my risk of a heart disease, but it also reduces my risk of osteoporosis, diabetes, mm -hmm. clinical depression, and probably dementia as well. I could give you that, but I wouldn't get, or not me personally, but the practice wouldn't get paid. It wouldn't be part of the quaff. Now, one of the problems is introducing something. Introducing anything in the NHS means a lot of work, a lot of effort, and they will do it if pharma are behind it or if there's a real reason that it's going to reduce disease and make a big sort of impact for a public health reason. Now, they won't do that for the menopause until they understand what the menopause is because every time I say the menopause should be categorised as a disease, I get shot down on social media. But let's think about disease actually and causing harm. Mm. And we've already said all these diseases that are associated. Now, uh, obesity for many years has not been thought of as a disease, but actually now it is thought of as a disease. Yeah. Um, because it has so many risk factors associated yeah. with it. And as you know, it's overtaken smoking as the commonest cause of cancer, you know, contributing cause for cancer, mm. risk factor for cancer. So if it's thought of as a disease, you automatically get more funding, you get more attention to it. Mm. So the problem is, if you ask people what 
menopause is, they'll say it's an inconvenience, it's a few symptoms, it's something that women just have to endure, and it can't be a disease because it affects 51% of the population. Mm. But actually, I can't think of anything else that has such negative effects on future yeah, health. It's a little such risks of other diseases. diseases. It's a little collection, and you are likely to get one of them. And, you know, in terms of women, one in two is going to get osteoporosis. So you really don't want that in your shopping bag if you if you don't have to have it. And I mean, that's what I, I find sort of extraordinary and, and sort of so irritating. But and another thing I want to ask you about, Louise, is digital, digital menopause world. And you've made this huge leap into it, I think almost much to your own surprise in a way, that you are, you know, doing the Steve Jobs of menopause you are uh, you've got this app the balance app it's great it's really easy to use i recommend it to everybody as the best source because it's really up to date um and you've got almost a million downloads and you're up there on the on the, the app charts with it um what does that i mean there's, there's a huge demand for good information yeah isn't there yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, as you know, I developed the Balance Up with a great team of people to try and improve awareness and diagnosis thinking, I wish I'd had it when I was perimenopausal instead of, you know, thinking all the things that I did without thinking about hormones. So what it does highlight more than anything else is this huge thirst and appetite for more information and knowledge from the users, from women. It's only allowed to be used by women. And um, it, it, it shows how important women are at being involved in this conversation. And it's highlighted, not that it's the most amazing app in the world, not that people go because they like the colors and the logo, mm -hmm. they're going out of sheer desperation. And that's, you know, really sad. We've had over 3 million comments on the community wow. section of the app. And I actually can't bear to look at them because I know I could help every single woman on there. But I don't sleep enough anyway, but I can't, I wouldn't ever get any rest if I was trying to help 3 million people on my own. But but actually, there's a lot more that we can do with technology. And this is one way. I mean, I also developed it because I knew that I would never be able to help all the women I want to help. Even in the UK, I would be so naive if I thought I could really help through my mm. clinic, um, 14 million women. But actually, I don't want to. I'm very uncomfortable charging a lot of money for people to come and see. But... The good thing is that some of the profits we use can fund balance and fund a lot of the other you know work I do. So there is some benefit, but actually we're working really hard behind the scenes to even look how we can use technology in different ways. And hopefully I can explain more over the next even few few months, I think, because what we're doing is quite going to really challenge the way that we um, undertake consultations, the way that we can be more patient led with what we do and use technology because technology is the only way we can reach people yeah. at scale. You know, I can I can download a new article on balance, press a button and that's it. It's gone to a million homes. Yeah. I can't do that with anything else, yeah. you know. So we've got some really exciting things up our sleeve that I think when they're switched on, we can really mm. make a difference to as many people as possible and as many different types of populations. I was possible. thinking about that because the, 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 the problem is that as we realize and, you know, smart women and smart 12 year olds are realizing that, you know, if they can take hormones, it's a brilliant plan. And, you know, once you get your HLT levels sorted out, you are not going to suffer and you're not going to risk getting these diseases and you're less likely to get a bees and you're less likely to forget everything and you're less likely to lose your job. And that's exactly what an elite of women have worked out. And I was very interested looking at LinkedIn the other day, all the people on LinkedIn who had responded a thousand women to a menopause survey and 63% of them were on HRT. And it was like, yeah, so those people are on mm. HRT. The people in boardrooms are quietly on HRT. But what happens, you know, in Glasgow, where I come from, you know, what about the economically deprived communities? What about the people struggling on drugs or just got off drugs? What about mm. the, the racial weathering on women who have suffered from racism all their lives and have earlier menopause? 
all those things, you know, this this is going to, you know, by by ignoring the, the future here, you know, the NHS and the government and whoever are, are, are making this divide and we've already got an economic divide and we've already got a health divide, but it's growing and growing and growing. Absolutely. And it, and it horrifies me. And I spend, as you know, a lot of time thinking about how do I reach women who I'll never see, I never come to the clinic. And, and actually, we've just given a free book of, of, of one of my books to every prison. Oh, well done. That's um, great. Because, yeah, I know. But and we're working with women who've had um, FGM, female genital mutilation, because you can't imagine what their perineum must be like when they've been cut when they're menopausal obviously the tissues become very thin they get urinary symptoms they get a lot of pain discomfort so it's how do we educate them me as a white english middle class woman it's going to be very hard going into those communities and try and explain in my very posh english voice (laughs) what it all means but we can educate we're working with some charities and we can educate the leaders of those charities who can then use their own language and terms and in a safe environment so but but technology obviously has a role with that with the different languages and everything else as well and learning about different cultures is so important and i think this is where trying to get into lower generations before they suffer Mm. so they could not not only educate themselves but they can educate their elders is going to make such a difference Mm. too now here i want to ask you 10 years time will there still be a shortage of the only body identical progesterone that seems to be around for most of us why is it just with one manufacturer and what can we do well, this is, I mean, it's crazy. I mean, you don't put all your eggs in one basket, do you? And this is what's yeah. happened with, with you. I went four, and months, but... four months to get mine uh, in my local pharmacy. When I started menopause work seven years ago, I wrote an article about the um, effects, the beneficial effects, especially with respect to cardiovascular disease for body identical hormones. And um, I got a letter of complaint. And as you know, I get lots of letters of complaint from all sorts of clinicians. And this doctor wrote and complained for two reasons. Firstly, how dare I say that HRT reduces risk of cardiovascular disease because he was taught it increased. And I did say, well, actually, if you read the article, there's a little number above the end of the sentence. And that number is, is related to the reference. And the reference is an article by Boardman et al. from the Cochrane database. So perhaps he could go back and not shoot the messenger, but read the original reference. So he was quiet then. And then he said, I've also always respected things you've written in the past, Dr. Newsom, but you've mentioned a drug I've never heard of called Utrogestan. Mm-hmm. Why mention a drug that you're only only prescribing in your posh private fancy clinic? And I said, no, look in the BNF. It's been there for years. And I thought, oh, people aren't realising about it. So obviously now people are. And actually I phoned the, the drug company and said, who's your women's health specialist? What education are you doing? So we don't have one because no one really prescribes you to just and it's not there. So to be fair to Bezans, they've gone from hardly any prescriptions to now millions of prescriptions literally overnight. And I did speak to the managing director tonight okay. and they've actually built and they're they're building a factory they've got nine he- nine acres of land <laughs> for a factory and they they're really cranking it up there's going to be a lull because there always will be our um ceo went and spoke to them last year to tell them about the plans and the projections are going mm. to increase for prescribing and he said then think big and he said louise our motto at the moment is think big because of what you've said to us so we are being bolder we are and it's a big it's a big financial commitment for um for a company especially when some people are saying we're prescribing too much hrt and we have to slow this down and so that's not what women are going to do women can see this very clearly and also just like myself and you when you pass through the door and you put on the menopause glasses, but we are not, because you are a patient too, and you have mm. changed, hormones cha- you know, have changed our lives overnight or within a couple of days. And I think yeah. we're, we're, we're different in a way from many doctors in that you are physicians who have cured thyself kind of thing. And, and so many of the great doctors are, you know, women of a certain age in the menopause movement. And I think that's really important that we that you understand it from the inside and you understand that you mm. couldn't remember the name of a prescription, you know, years ago before, you know, you, you went on HRT. And and I think that changes the way the way we think. 
And I think it's incredibly it important to understand this from the inside as well as the outside and reading the science. But a lot of it is about emotion in midlife and we're all struggling with all sorts of other things. And to understand that additional burden on women who are holding up so much, particularly if they're working and they've got a family, uh, you know, we understand that. We are those people that we're talking to. We're not mm. coming from above. In fact, we've come from right below and dug our way out. And I think, I think people should remember that about you too and that you're not, you know, coming in, in you know, all dressed in white like an angel. You've actually struggled from the bottom to yes. to do this and and i think that's that's really important here's another mad thing i want to talk about before we go is you know how people are always saying to you we need to go the natural route and isn't it marvelous that orcas killer whales have the same menopause as women they're the only other species that have it there's one other kind of whale as well but these big whales big killer whales and i thought right i'm just i'm really interested in that i thought i'll look up this because i'm a geek now too but I'll look up the testosterone level in the blubber of orcas, male and female. So I, I, I'm wondering how, you know, the orca at age 40 has her menopause and can go on to live about 90 and lead the pod and lead them to salmon. And, you know, pods that are led by these grandmother orcas mm -hmm. do really well and the young thrive better in their wise pods. So that's really, really interesting. And of course, it's like, this is totally natural. Dead. Then I looked at the testosterone levels and obviously they didn't necessarily know what stage each female whale was at. But basically they have half the testosterone that male whales have. So that's a huge amount, isn't it? Compared to us. Mm -hmm. So what is that female orca doing with all that testosterone in later life? You know, and is she, why is she leading the pod? And, you know, there is that thing that you think that there are those women in life like I, I one of my heroes is Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the, the great American jurist on the Supreme Court who, who died a few years ago. And, you know, I always thought she must have a lot of testosterone to be doing that in the 80s. Mm. Um, and so everything everybody tells you, you know, this is the natural way. Look at the blubber samples and see what hormones are in them. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's it's fascinating, isn't it? And I think when you look at nature, what do you mean by natural? You know, I go into my garden, it's beautiful. It's, it's spring at the minute. So the flowers are out, the blossoms are out. You know, we only need to look around us and is, it, nature is wonderful. But I wouldn't want to go and eat my garden. I wouldn't want to eat half the stuff that's growing there or growing wild. So when people say I want a natural treatment, what does natural mean, of course? And a lot of these supplements are for symptoms, but we've already said that menopause is far more than symptoms. And then we think about our conversation earlier about aging and inflammation. You know, were we really designed to live for so long and get dementia? You know, dementia is the cruelest condition. I don't need to tell you because you've got first-hand experience, but it's, it's a horrible, mm -hmm horrible condition we're not designed to have dementia we're not designed to keep living and so medicine has advanced so much you know cancer treatment so much better we, we when I was younger as a junior doctor we I always saw so many people with strokes so many people with heart attacks that's better because management of hypertension has improved we're now going the other way because of obesity obviously there's far more other conditions but um we we really not designed to have all this time without hormones and if people really really push back okay well that, that's fine if you're over 50 and you decide you don't want hormones that's fine as long as you know the risks that's that's absolutely fine and of course if you optimize your diet if you optimize your exercise you will mitigate some of these increased risk of diseases but then look, let's look at those people who are under the age of 41 um, sorry under the age of 51 or even under the age of 40 who have premature ovarian insufficiency POI. We've always been taught one in a hundred women under the age of 40, but a recent study shows that it's probably more like 3%, and I think it's probably even more than that, who have an early menopause. Well, there's nothing natural about not having your hormones in your 20s or mm -hmm. 30s. So 3% of half of the population is still a lot of people, and there's a lot of disease associated with it. But then if you think, well, if you're 100% you want to treat people when they're young, what happens to them? 
between their 50th and their 51st birthday. Do they really change? Do their bodies really change? Of course they don't. So why do we then need to stop something? So we've got to think about sort of this meddling with nature or not. And then the other thing to add to that is, as you know, I get a lot of pushback because people say that now I'm over medicalizing the menopause and it's natural. Well, the average number of medications that women I see in my menopause clinic are on when they're not on HRT is about three or four, you know. And so they are being medicalized with other drugs, usually antidepressants, as you know, but there are other drugs that people are giving to try and help with their symptoms, such as gabapentin, which is a horrible drug, really horrible drug. Some people are given antidepressants for their vasomotor symptoms, their flushes. People will put all sorts of things in their vaginas, which actually aren't made for their vaginas to try and help some of the burning, the irritation, the discomfort. Mm. The antibiotics that are used for urinary tract infections, which are often associated with low hormones, they're not very natural. So we've just got to take a step back before we get into this boxing match about natural or medicalization. Mm. I think we need to just look. And hormones, like you say, they're plant-based. They're just not even medication, they are just hormones that we're, we're, we're and using And what here. nobody seems to understand, I mean, the idea that one patch suits all women is absolutely hilarious because we know all our hormones are completely different, never mind every day, but from all our friends. And that that's really difficult. But, you know, the very simple thing of saying, are you over-prescribing estrogen? Are you not? I mean, I have it very simply, if I have two pumps of estrogel a day and I get mine from the NHS from my local doctor, I get hot flushes. If I use three pumps, I do not get hot flushes. Now, it's absolutely clear to me that's exactly the level I should be at because my body has agreed that that is good for me. And I've done that over time and, and it just it just makes complete sense. And, and I've been doing studies for my uh, pill documentary and we've been talking to people uh, sequencing sort of the genome around hormones and they are sequencing the levels of estrogen and whether women with certain genes absorb estrogen or progesterone or whatever more or less or react badly and by looking at women who've had terrible symptoms on the pill they can see that their particular pattern is different and then they can look at another woman and say you're going to be fine taking the pill because you don't have this weird selection of you know this this, this, mm. this selection in, in your genome and and you know we know that we can sequence it we can see it just like we can see our ancestry you know and the idea that we are one cookie cutter human being and that you can stick the same patch on me because i'm just a woman and i'm old and i'm complaining is so utterly wrong and kind of really misogynist and really in uncomprehending i think so i'm i'm very it interested is. in doctors being taught that HRT is incredibly complicated and, you know, it is not literally a sticking plaster on your arm. Absolutely. And I think a lot of it, again, the common sense has gone out of the menopause. And so even when I was first prescribed my HRT by someone who's a very eminent um, menopause specialist who's very high up in the International Menopause Society, I was given a 100 microgram patch uh, with some progesterone and went off to see if I felt any better. And three months later, I contacted him and said, mm, I feel a bit better, but I still feel rubbish, actually. I'm still getting bats about migraines. I'm still getting night sweats. I'm still getting joint pain. And I feel as miserable as sin. So he did my estradiol level and it was low. And he said, well, just use two patches. And I said, oh, no, I can't do that because that seems really high. He said, don't be ridiculous. You're not absorbing it properly. I said, yeah, you're right, actually. My patches do slide a bit. They often end up in my jeans I don't think they stick that well at all so I used two patches and then after a couple of days my night sweats improved my mood my energy my concentration didn't but that was testosterone deficiency rather than estrogen and I felt but I did feel better and that makes complete sense so what I'm being prescribed is not actually what is going into my body because my patches do not stick very well but if I use the gel it just slides and slips and it doesn't really get absorbed very well in, in my skin so there's all this narrative that we're prescribing too much but actually it we're all different so the amount that's absorbed through the skin can really vary but actually the amount of hormone that I need is probably different to what you need and probably very different to my 22 year old patient 
patient who I saw yesterday needs because her body requires a higher dose. And we see this in other hormones. I've prescribed 25 micrograms levothyroxine for people with hypothyroidism. And I've also prescribed 225 micrograms to very similar looking women with very similar symptoms, but their requirements have been very different. When I ran a diabetic clinic, I'd see women and men with type one diabetes and they'd all need different requirements of insulin. So why is estrogen so different? Why is it we so worried about our own hormone? I'm not aware of any data showing that there are risks or benefits with high dose antidepressants or lithium or quetiapine or the drugs that have no biochemical measurement that we see a lot of menopausal women on. So we're almost singling out a hormone, trying to prove that it's dangerous for women when we're not looking at all the other drugs that people are given at a sort of ad nauseum almost. Um, so it doesn't all add up. No, no, none of this adds up. But what, 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 what always, when, when things are really difficult and, and you find sort of, you know, an establishment saying, oh, that can't possibly do that and this isn't good for women. And, you know, um, I just think that women know what they're doing and having sort of made these two in this third documentary and i'm very aware on the pill that there's going to be this huge push of women saying we've been gaslighted about our side effects for years mm -hmm. we genuinely do have these even though you haven't done a randomized controlled trial of a million people we happen to know <laughs> that you know we're coming off the pill mm -hmm. because we're depressed and we feel much better than you know the month mm -hmm. after and that women's truth is not being heard in both departments of hormones, both down at the pill end in your early life, and we happily give women the pill for 30 years, oh my God, and we hand it out free and it only costs a pound a month, but yet HRT is some other weird stuff, even though it's much safer and the formulation is much safer than the pill. Absolutely. What are we doing there? What is the game? The game is that men are involved in benefiting from the pill. Men are not necessarily involved in benefiting from HRT, although I have to say, that in my life, <laughs> men do benefit from the HRT in terms of my mood. Of course they do. They get more, they get more um, sex. But, and, uh, you know, yeah, it, uh, uh, it is absolutely but... clear that it's okay for 70% of women to try the pill, but HRT is over there. And it is a deep, deep-seated medical misogyny, which I am very glad you are fighting. Thank you, Kate. <laughs> so before we end... You have to ask me three take home oh, tips God. because I always ask. I want to know what's in, so what, I don't no, know what you're going to no, ask What's me. in your handbag? What do you carry around? <laughs> so the three things that I can't survive without in my handbag is obviously number one, my mobile phone, mm -hmm. because I'm addicted. Obviously, I have so much going on all the time. Number two is my glasses, because without my glasses, I can't read my mobile phone because I'm old and I need glasses. And number three, I'm always, well, I could have maybe three and four. The, the two things that are really important to me are having herbal tea bags because I don't have caffeine. And the other one is Zomatriptan, which is a migraine tablet. I have to have that on me at all time because, as you know, I often get migraines and triggered by all sorts of things. So those are the things in my handbag that I have to mm. have. The other things, my notebook and my pen, really important because I'm a bit old fashioned with writing down lists. I have lists all the time of things that I think of, people I need to contact, things I need to do. So, yes, I don't have a big handbag because that's enough <laughs> for me. No, that was good information. <laughs> okay, you can go. Well, thank you very much. It feels very weird being the other side of my podcast. And I know we've gone a bit over time, but I hope um, you've all enjoyed it. And I am going to ask Kate to come back to talk about the documentary, because although the contraceptive pill might be thought of as not for menopause, actually a lot of perimenopausal women are on it and a lot of women who have hormonal changes and my interest is not just about the perimenopause and menopause it's about health longevity and hormonal health for men and women actually um for for all ages so i'm looking forward to our conversation next so thanks ever so much for your time today kate it's been great thank you you can find out more about newson health group by visiting www.newsonhealth.co.uk and you can download the free Balance app on the App Store or Google Play.